Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to your daily dose of scripture news and commentary. Today is Monday, April the 1st, 2024. Uh, you know, typically this day is known as April Fool's Day. Well, the Bible says that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And so we could also declare this to be National Atheist Day today as well. So there is that. Anyway, happy April 1st. And here we are, Monday, start of a new week, start of a new month. Trust your uh, celebration of the resurrected Christ it was a blessed day yesterday. It was for us, and uh, we serve a risen Savior. Praise God. There was a scripture that came to me yesterday morning um, as I was up early, just kind of preparing my heart for the day. And then um, it, it ties in with a thought. And I want to, I want to, I want to bring this scripture and this thought together. They they appear to be kind of disconnected, at least at first, but I'll. I'll bring them together for you here in just a minute. But here's the scripture. It's found in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. It says that for whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, uh, a lot of discussion is, is involved with this verse discussing the first part where it's discussing predestination. I don't want to look at the predestination piece, but I want to look at this phrase here that God, God brought us to himself for one purpose, and it was, con it was to conform us to the image of his son, that Jesus might be the firstborn among man many brethren. So what it's saying is, is that Jesus is the forerunner, He's the son of God. Well, as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then God wants to conform us into the image of Jesus. So Jesus is just the firstborn among many. So there's going to be many that are brought to God through Jesus Christ that are going to be like Jesus. And that's the thought that's being brought out here that I really want to just key on here for a moment. God wants us to be like Jesus. Now, Here's also then the thought that came to me yesterday morning, and again, this might appear to be disconnected um, from this at first, but I'll connect the scripture to this thought here in just a minute. And here's, here's what popped into my head yesterday. Faith comes through relationship. It comes through connectedness. Now, let me just illustrate it this way. My wife trusts me because she knows me, because she's intimate with me and vice versa. I trust her, and I put my faith and trust in her and what she says because I know her. Now, my wife could say X, Y, Z, or she could say thus and so to me, and, and I would listen to that a lot more than if I heard the same thing from a stranger. It would mean something completely different to me because of our relationship. And so, when my wife speaks to me because we have a relationship because there's a connectedness between the two of us. When she says something to me, um, it means a whole lot more to me. I put my faith and trust in it than if I were to hear those same words from a stranger on the streets. Now, in the context of faith, here's what occurred to me. Relationship and connectedness matter a great deal. Think of, think of the greatest example of faith in Scripture. And, and we could often think of, you know, Elijah or David, or of course we point to Abraham as the father of our faith. But, but I want you to think about the greatest, greatest example of faith in Scripture, and it's none other than Jesus Christ. He was continually operating in faith during his ministry on earth, and he put that on display through the various things that he did. Jesus trusted the leading of the Father and of the Holy Spirit, and here's why. It's because he was intimate with the Father. It's because he was intimate with the Holy Spirit. He knew them. And so because of that, Jesus lived in a realm of constant communion with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. He was constantly, there was this constant pipeline, this, this communication, this connectedness between him and the Father. And that's why he always responded to needs that were around him. He always responded to those needs outside of earthly norms. And he responded to those needs outside of earthly constraints. So think of just a few examples here for a minute. Think of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Look at the contrast in thought between Jesus' approach to that problem and the disciples' approach to that problem. 
you know, Jesus said, I don't want to send the 5,000 away because by the time they get home, they're all going to faint because they've been with me now three days and, and they might faint in the way. They don't have anything to eat. So that's the problem. That's the problem statement. Well, you look at the solution statement that the disciples presented and they said, okay, where can we buy meat? You see, they were, they were responding to this need that was being presented to them based on earthly norms and based on earthly constraints. They said, hey, we don't have enough money to buy meat for all these people. And even if we did, where, where's the Walmart? Where can we go buy the meat for all of these people? There wasn't a shop anywhere close to them. So they approached it from an earthly norm and based on earthly constraints. Well, Jesus didn't do that. He said, you feed them. And then we know the rest of the story. He took the five loaves and the two fishes and he, he blessed them and he broke them and gave them to, to the disciples and the disciples gave to the 5,000 and then they gathered up 12 baskets after that. Think of Jesus sleeping in the midst of a storm. And again, you've got this contrast. Jesus is sleeping. The disciples are bailing. Uh, think of Jesus telling the crowd that the girl was not dead, but she was only sleeping. Well, you see, that was an act of faith. That was a faith declaration at that point. Think of Jesus giving his body to the cross and then to the grave as well. One of the last things that he said was, Father, into thine hands I commit my spirit. So, so he committed himself to the cross and to the grave um, as, a, as a divine act of faith. He had to have ultimate faith in his father to be able to do that. And my point in bringing up these, these, these different examples, and you could fill in the blank with any example that you can find in the Gospels, but what you'll find is that everything that he did came from him being connected to the Father. Because of his relationship with the Father, Jesus lived outside of the natural realm, and, and he never resorted to natural solutions and means when it came to responding to a need that was in front of him. You see, it's, it's almost like the Holy Spirit was this conduit, the Holy Spirit was this pipeline that allowed him to be continuously connected to the Father. And so when he encounters a, a dead body, when he encounters a, a need of feeding 5,000 people, the, while the disciples are looking at this on a horizontal plane, Jesus is connected to the Father, and it's almost like he's getting a direct download into his spirit from the Father through the Holy Ghost into his spirit as to what he should do. There was that constant connection, that constant relationship that existed between Jesus and the Father. And so then he would, he would make a faith decree, or he would do something in faith, or he would go to sleep in the midst of a storm, or he would take the, the five loaves and the two fishes and he would do something crazy and a miracle would happen. Well, you see, he was demonstrating faith for us during that process, but that faith came from one thing. It came from relationship. It came from connectedness to the Father. Jesus' own words, you see it repeatedly, I believe, in the book of John, where he declares, I and my Father are one. So there was this constant communion that was taking place between Jesus and the Father. And then as a result of that, faith came out of that. And so here's the lesson for us today, and it's this. If our faith is weak, we need to check our relationship with the Lord. If we have weak faith, we need to look at our relationship. We, look, we need to look at the communion time that we're spending with him. Because the more that we connect with him, just like between me and my wife, the more that we connect, we communicate, we laugh, we, we chop wood together, we go to town together, we buy groceries together, we just, we're connected all the time. And the more that we spend time with each other, the more that we get to know each other and the more we trust each other. Well, you see, it's that way with God. The more time that we spend with him, and get to know him, and, and we operate within his realm, and we let the Holy Spirit be that conduit that provides free flow between the Father and ourselves, the more our faith is going to grow. But you see, if you don't spend time with God, if you don't spend time getting to know him, then you're not going to trust him. And then what's going to happen is when you're presented with a problem, when you're presented with a need, you're going to default to natural means. That's because we're natural beings. So we'll naturally be natural unless we spend time with the Father, and then, then we might naturally start to become supernatural. 
because of that connectedness with the Father. So let's connect this now to our verse. I said I was going to connect this thought that I had with this verse that popped into my mind as well. Here's the objective of this verse. It's that we, that we would be conformed to the image of his son, that we would be like Jesus, that, that Jesus would just be the firstborn among many brethren who are also acting like him. That's essentially what it's saying. Now, here's the thing. If God wants us to be like Jesus, then that includes, I think, living in a sphere of the, super, of the supernatural as well. He wants us to have that constant state of connectedness with himself, just like Jesus did. And because we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to have that constant state of connectedness with the Father through the Holy Spirit as well. And God wants us living and moving in the Spirit and being connected to the Father and operating outside of natural means, outside of the natural norms, responding to things that are around us based on, based on a supernatural response, not just a natural response. Now, this is what separates all the great men of faith in Scripture. In recent videos, I was talking about Caleb and how that Caleb had another spirit. Well, you see, Caleb's life source was not based on what he was seeing around him. His life source came from within his spirit, where his spirit was connected with the Lord, and his faith came then from knowing the Lord and his ways. And so while everybody else was marching to the tune of circumstances, and they were living from the outside in, Caleb was living from the inside out. And that's what gave him another spirit. And so when Caleb came up against overwhelming odds, he just really knew that the other side didn't stand a chance. That's how David was with Goliath. And so, as I pointed out in previous videos, it's not that you need another circumstance, you need another spirit. And you get that through your connectedness with the Father. That only comes from spending time with the Lord. And the, the primary ingredient, again, of being a champion of faith is hearing and internalizing the Word of God. That's spending time with God as you spend time in the Scripture, reading the Scripture, seeing what words God has for you, because then all of a sudden, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Well, what happens if you're spending all of your time on the Internet? What happens if you're spending all of your time on Facebook? What happens if you're spending all of your time researching um, conspiracy theories, which might in fact be true, but what happens if you spend all of your time with the problem or with the disease? You're not going to become one with the Father. You're going to become one with the problem. And so you've got to internalize God's promises, and, and that's what your faith has to anchor to. Now, I don't know about you, but you know when I look at how Jesus spent his life living and moving in the realms of the spirit being constantly connected to his father through the holy spirit i look at him and i say jesus if you're the firstborn among many brethren then i want that same relationship with the father that you had and i too want to move with with, with that kind of of uh, spirit connectedness so that i respond to problems and respond to situations not based on what i see but based on what the father is downloading into my spirit at that time God's design is for his life to take hold of you and to take over. And he wants his spirit and his word to become the driving force in your life today. And when that happens, friends, there's nothing on the outside that's going to shake your confidence. And you're going to start to exercise your authority in God with the boldness of a lion. And you're going to be different. Just rest assured, you're going to be different from other people around you. It's just going to be the natural result of that. But it's going to be a good difference. It's not just because you're weird. Okay, It's because God's Spirit is directing you. And you're stepping out and you're moving in faith. A faith realm that's a totally different dimension than the natural world around us. All right, I'm going to close with the words of the Lord for the United States of America. America, you are the house of Israel in Scripture. You are my people and America is my nation. You are my Zion, a city set upon a hill, a light to the world. Return to me and I will return to you. Repent and I will restore you. Come out of your prison of unbelief, fear, and intimidation. And remember the words found in Psalms 33 and verse 12, which say, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. All right, have a great week, everybody. Stan out.